Good afternoon. The State and Local Government and Veterans Committee will come to order. A quorum is present. We're grateful to have you here today. Uh, for committee members, uh, we have a full agenda with overviews and uh, two confirmations before us. And I want to let you know, uh, uh, thinking ahead, uh, on Thursday, uh, we're going to take up uh, two bills um, that I would expect uh, we can complete uh, within the committee hearings time. So uh, paid family and medical leave, earned sick and safe time, two proposals moving through. Both have some jurisdiction in this committee, so we're hoping to take those committees. Or we will take those bills up on Thursday and hope to move them through in the committee slotted time. If we need to go over, we can go over and meet in the evening. That would not be my hope, but um, I just want to let people know that it is the intention to take those up and move them out of the committee on Thursday. And then next week, uh, just a, a, a look ahead, we should be uh, hearing from the various councils um, and the work that they do, and we will be taking up bills, I believe, on both Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, and those will be posted, of course, uh, with notice. But I did want to let people know um, that next week we'll be doing uh, more work on bills themselves in, in addition to the continued overview. And the jurisdiction of this committee is fairly significant, so we'll be continuing to bring people in to share the book of work that they do so we're informed and prepared uh, and at the same time continue to move bills as we are now in the fourth week of the session. So... Just wanted to give everybody a heads up on uh, the week ahead. And then uh, for today, uh, really delighted, and uh, we're going to hear from a number of people uh, from uh, a few agencies uh, to talk with us about the work that they do. And as I said, we're going to take up a couple of confirmations. So I'd like to invite first uh, to join us uh, Commissioner Roberts Davis um, from the Department of Admin Administration. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your names uh, for the record, and you can begin. I know you're going to do an overview, and then when we're through that, we'll, we have your resume, and we will be taking up uh, your confirmation here in this committee. So welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm Alice Roberts-Davis, Commissioner for the Department of Administration. I'm joined today by our Legislative Director at the Department of Administration, Julie Byrell. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to provide a brief overview of the Department of Administration. You will see that our 25 divisions do a lot of different things, so I'm just going to, in the interest of time, talk uh, at a high level about what we do, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Our agency has a wide-ranging set of responsibilities that ultimately touch every part of state government. Our role is to help government best serve Minnesotans, and we do that through cost-effective and transparent services that make government more accessible and responsible to the public. We are a central service agency, which means that in large part, our partners and customers are other state agencies. We also serve the governor's office, the legislature, local municipalities, and nonprofit organizations. In addition, we do provide some critical services directly to Minnesotans as well. So you can get an idea of the size and scope of our work. Here are a few statistics about admin. Our partners that are internal to state government rely on us to provide the critical core services that help them operate effectively. These services include overseeing the state's annual purchasing of $3 billion annually in goods and services. We manage 6,200 state-owned buildings, 800 property leases, and more than 290 annual construction projects. We also manage a fleet of more than 2,000 vehicles, and we are the enterprise's insurance agent, protecting $20.6 billion of insured state assets. Our total budget is a mix of legislatively appropriated general fund, enterprise service funds, special revenue funds, and federal grants. The general fund makes up only about 12% of admin's budget, but that's somewhat misleading, as half of that is legislatively appropriated pass-through funds, such as in lieu of rent and grants funding for public television and radio stations. 
The remaining general fund operating budget is dispersed across 13 divisions. It also includes two open forecasted appropriations, one for grants for historic preservation projects, and one to cover our workers' compensation reinsurance premiums. Next, I will highlight the work of our divisions. So specifically, what do we do? Uh, as you entered the building today, you probably saw some facilities maintenance workers who were shoveling the sidewalks or keeping the Senate building clean and operational. They are our most visible service, but there's a lot more that we do that's not public facing. We manage, construct, and lease property for state government. Our team members in the facilities management division are the ones who respond when a light bulb needs to be replaced or when you need your office painted. They maintain and operate 23 state-owned buildings, including the state capitol, the parking facilities, monuments, and the grounds. When money is appropriated to agencies for construction projects, our real estate and construction services division manages that work. Those projects include planned bonding projects and un unanticipated emergency repair work. The division also provides comprehensive leasing services to state agencies. They negotiate and manage 800 property leases annually, including state-operated group homes throughout Minnesota. The Enterprise Real Property Division coordinates property data for 19 state agencies, and the division utilizes that information to help us determine which state assets need preservation funding and the fiscal impact of deferring facility maintenance. We manage the state's fleet, equipment, and insurance. We lease vehicles to state agencies for official state business, and we manage the life cycle for roughly 2,000 vehicles. The Surplus Services Division helps state and federal agencies dispose of their property that they no longer need through either donation or auction. And the Risk Management Division is the state's insurance agent, and we cover insurance needs as well as workers' compensation. The division also works to reduce injuries by leading the state's safety program called MinSafe. We provide cost-effective services to support the entire enterprise. The Small Agency Resource Team, or SMART, provides administrative services to the state's small agencies, boards, and councils. And this central service model allows those entities to save money and focus on their missions. The Office of Enterprise Sustainability works with cabinet-level agencies to streamline their operations and bolster their resiliency. They help agencies reduce their energy and water usage and diminish their waste. The office also partners with our fleet and and procurement divisions to integrate sustainability into all state services. The Office of Collaboration and Dispute Resolution uses proven strategies to help government and stakeholders develop solutions to seemingly impossible problems. We manage the state's public contracting. The Office of State Procurement oversees the state's goods and services purchases. The division negotiates volume discounts for state agencies and local units of government through 2,300 contracts. And in fiscal year 2022, the office negotiated over $14 million in contract savings. The office also manages the largest multi-state cooperative purchasing program in the country. Their colleagues in the Office of Equity in Procurement ensure greater equity in state contracting and construction. They promote opportunities to do business with the state and provide assistance to small businesses owned by women, minorities, people with physical disabilities, and veterans as they seek state contracts. In fiscal year 2022, we successfully increased state purchasing to $148 million with targeted group businesses. The Procurement Technical Assistance Center, or PTAC, offers free training and counseling to all Minnesota businesses interested in selling their products to government. The Minnesota PTAC is nationally recognized as a top program and is in funded in part through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Department of Defense's Office of Small Business Programs. The federal government has changed the name of this program to be Apex Accelerators, and admin will be transitioning to that new name in the coming months. The work of our Community Services Division uh, is our most public-facing entity. The State Demographic Center analyzes and interprets demographic data and shares that with the public. They were also Minnesota's official liaison with the U.S. Census Bureau for the 2020 Census, and their work helped Minnesota achieve a 75.1% response rate, which was the best in the nation. The Office of the State Archaeologist and the State Historic Preservation Office, or SHPO, protect Minnesota's cultural resources, including archaeological and cemetery sites and historic structures. They work with state, local, and federal government entities and the public to assess proposed development projects and their potential impact on cultural sites. 
Admin's other community services divisions ensure access to state government for all Minnesotans. The Governor's Council on Developmental Disabilities works to assure that per people with developmental disabilities receive the necessary support to achieve increased independence, self-determination, productivity, and integrity, in, excuse me, in integration into the community. A system of technology to achieve results or STAR helps all Minnesotans with disabilities gain access to and acquire the assistive technology that they need to live, learn, work, and play. The Minnesota STAR program is federally funded by the Department of Health and Human Services. The Office of Grants Management works in partnership with more than 30 state agencies and organizations to standardize, streamline, and improve state grant making practices and increase public information about state grant opportunities. And finally, the Data Practices Office is a statewide resource on Minnesota's Open Meeting Law and Data Practices Act. So as you can see, our work is very diverse. We cover all types of functions, and uh, that completes my high-level overview of the Department of Administration. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about the amazing work that we do, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Mm -hmm. Oh, should I move right in? Move right into Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Uh, members, uh, the materials that we just saw, the PowerPoint presentation, we will make sure you receive. It wasn't in your packets, but we will make sure you get it um, so that you have that information. Uh, and I appreciate you uh, bringing that forward. Mm -hmm. Members, are there questions for the commissioner? Senator Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, looking at what you presented on your PowerPoint, I, I would like a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, if that's possible. It doesn't seem to, I don't catch all the different things that you've mentioned here on here. So if I could get a copy of that, that would be great. Uh, yes, uh, Senator Anderson and members, uh, the PowerPoint presentation uh, was not in your packet, but we're getting it for members. Do you want it uh, in this moment? Would you like me to get you a copy now, or do you need it uh, going forward? As soon as possible. All right, uh, Senator Anderson, we'll have our page get you a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. Would you like to hold your questions until you have it before you? Excuse me? Uh, Senator Anderson, did you have following questions? Any other questions? I know. All right, thank you, Senator. Are there other questions for the commissioner? Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. So in your presentation, one of the, on one of your earlier slides, you, you showed that you had a 53 point something reduction in carbon emissions. Could you go into that a little more? What exactly did you do to cut, every, cut your carbon emissions in half? Commissioner. Madam Chair, uh, Senator, thank you for the question. We established the Office of Enterprise Sustainability in 2017, and the work of that uh, division has been to work directly with state agencies to monitor what they're using in uh, greenhouse gas emissions, waste, water, all of those things. We put into place a really comprehensive strategy around how we would reduce um, the carbon footprint for the state. We have uh, sustainability coordinators within each agency who are working directly with leadership in those agencies to monitor our usage of all of those things. And it's really just been a structure that's been in place to make sure that we're measuring and reducing uh, monitoring, and that's been the impetus for the drive down uh, is basically the, the analytics around it. We also produce a, a dashboard that uh, people can interact with and shows exactly what usage looks like, but it's really been about the um, intentional measurement and reduction um, things that we put into place. Senator Barr. Madam Chair, um, I thought it might have something to do with using you know, electricity that came from Manitoba uh, hydropower and conversion of uh, switching from coal to uh, natural gas would have been like your prime drivers, but um, I appreciated all the backstory behind that. I was curious, is, is that where the majority of this is, or are you just less, less electric use or uh, fuel use? Uh, just some of the bigger pieces as opposed to all the spe spe specific analytics behind it. What were some of the major drivers to push that down? Commissioner Roberts Davis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We did do uh, use less electricity, again, just by making sure that agencies were aware of 
cost-saving tips on how to turn off monitors, how to turn off electricity when they leave for the day. Um, we looked at waste specifically. We looked at how we were uh, managing our procurement. And so uh, a lot of it has really just been around the structure, the education, and pushing that out at the agency level. Thank you, Sen Thank you Senator Barr. Are there further questions on the presentation? Senator Curran. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner. Uh, We've we've had we've done a lot of work since uh, you, we both have arrived in this position, and so um, around state procurement and of course specifically the RFP process. I know we've worked a bunch on some of the IT projects, but have we moved the invitation to negotiate process throughout the uh, throughout all of the other purchasing opportunities? And if so, um, do you plan to move that further along? And what have been the results? Thank you. Commissioner Roberts Davis. Madam Chair, Senator Crown, thank you so much for the question. Uh, you're right, we have spent a lot of time talking about procurement over the years and we greatly appreciate the suggestion that you brought forward about invitation to negotiate. It is something that we are employing right now within the agency. It's something that uh, on the small scale that we've tried it has been very successful. We're excited about the results and we are looking forward to expanding that uh, opportunity within our procurement toolbox. Thank you, Matt. And, uh, Matt thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, just a quick follow-up. And so what has been some of the feedback from both the vendor community and the agencies themselves who are actually the, um, the, the, the agency side from a need perspective? Commissioner Roberts Davis. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator, the feedback that we've gotten is that people appreciate the opportunity to sit down on the front end and talk about what they bring to the table uh, in, the, in the invitation to negotiate. Uh, I haven't heard from agencies yet about what the feedback is, but from my procurement team, they are really excited about the, the um, flexibility that it has brought and the ability to drive cost savings. Thank you, Senator Coran. Are there further questions on the presentation from the commissioner and her overview? All right, uh, seeing no further questions, then we will move to the next item of business, uh, which is uh, taking up the uh, confirmation of this commissioner who is before us in your packet. There is uh, a document, which is her resume. Um, we're grateful that you're here. Um, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your tenure, and uh, why you are the candidate for this job going forward? Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today and for your consideration of my confirmation. Uh, the Department of Administration is an amazing agency, and we have an incredibly diverse portfolio, as you just heard. We have the ability to impact all state agencies and all branches of state government to deliver services to Minnesotans, and that's an incredible honor. Our mission is to provide leadership, innovation, solutions, and support to help our partners succeed. And uh, my incredible team is as committed as I am to meeting and exceeding that mission. It has been my privilege to lead the agency for the last four years, and I hope that with your support, I will have the opportunity to continue into Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan's second term. A little bit about my background. I am the proud daughter of an immigrant who came to America for a college education. My dad met my mother, who is an American, and uh, raised my brother and me with a strong emphasis on education and achievement, and uh, I have the absolute best parents in the world. I am also the proud mother of one daughter, who is a freshman at Vanderbilt University. I spent my formative years in Nashville, Tennessee, and then moved and attended high school in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. I attended the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign for my undergraduate degree, and then made a huge geographic change to attend the Florida State University College of Law. I've made Minnesota my home now for 20 years, and although I came here for the professional opportunities, I have chosen to stay because the work that I do matters and the people that we serve matter to me. After I earned my law degree, each career move I made have uh, prepared me for this role. I spent most of my career in the private sector, primarily in commercial real estate development. I spent 12 years as an executive at Target Corporation where I specialized in real estate development, strategic sourcing, supplier diversity, and compliance. I joined the Department of Administration in 2015 as an assistant commissioner to oversee the department's uh, construction and leasing operations, to manage their $3 billion in procurement, and to establish the Office of Equity in Procurement, and for the transition of the Procurement Technical Assistance Center to the state. 
My first four years as commissioner have been an extraordinary experience with uh, several notable successes for the department. During that time, we led a successful first in the nation complete count census effort leading to Minnesota retaining our eight congressional seats by a margin of just 26 respondents. We increased contracting with diverse and veteran owned small businesses from 3.8% of state purchasing when I joined Advent to now 9%. We've negotiated leases on behalf of the state for 15 COVID-19 testing sites, 12 vaccination sites, and alternate care sites. We managed construction on time and on budget of three new veterans homes in Bemidji, Montevideo, and Preston, as well as a new veterans cemetery in Redwood County. We've increased fuel efficiency to 31 miles per gallon on average for fleet vehicles replacement in FY22 and we established greater transparency with the publication of an online dashboard for state agency efforts to reduce energy use, greenhouse gas emissions, water use, and solid waste generation. And that's just a snapshot of the great work that admin team members do regularly and provide on a daily basis. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Governor Walls tasked me with leading an interagency team of state procurement professionals, project managers, and Minnesota National Guard supply and logistics specialists to procure critical care supplies such as ventilators and 95 masks and other critical medical supplies at a time when those items were scarce and difficult to find globally. We were able to procure more than 50 million pieces of personal protective equipment and this work ensured that hospitals and long-term care facilities had the equipment that they needed to take care of Minnesotans and protect their vital staff. Those supplies were also distributed to schools and helped keep them going during subsequent surges. Additionally, my team has also helped stand up the state's online ordering portal that has distributed nearly 3 million free COVID test kits to Minnesotans through Amazon. The next four years bring new opportunities and challenges that the department is well positioned to help the state lead in addressing. While much of the department's work is behind the scenes, our services are critical to the functioning of state government. In the past several years have altered our expectations of the workplace and expectations of government services. The department will play a pivotal role in state government's ability to adapt and lead. And so at a high level, I plan to focus on a workplace that supports the delivery of critical services and help the state remain a workplace of choice, increase participation by Minnesota small businesses in transparent and equitable state procurement processes, reduce the carbon footprint of the state through process and infrastructure improvements that are sustainable and sound business, and then ensure that access to government by all Minnesotans through adaptive technology, advocacy, and um, those with disabilities have transparency and quality facilities. The governor and lieutenant governor's budget recommendations provide an overview of the direction and values in which I hope to lead the department over the next four years, and we will be discussing those in depth throughout the session. I look forward to providing greater detail on that vision and learning from your questions and advice to achieve the goals that we collectively share. Again, I am truly humbled to have this opportunity and the responsibility to which the governor and lieutenant governor have appointed me, it has been the opportunity of a lifetime. I wanna thank you again for your time and consideration today and I look forward to any questions that you may have as we move through this confirmation process. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, I appreciate that and as a member uh, of the Senate only in my second term, I will say that the experience thus far of listening to somebody uh, coming before the committee uh, seeking confirmation has been a, a, a pr pretty profoundly moving uh, experience for me, and I can only imagine that it feels like that for you. Yes. Um, we have high expectations um, in this committee, and if you look across the table, you can see that we come from a variety of places, and backgrounds, and ideology, um, and we don't all agree on everything, but there's real expertise in this committee. Um, and as the committee with the jurisdiction over uh, this administration, if you will, uh, in terms of its budget, uh, I have high expectations for effectiveness and equity uh, as you move forward. And I heard uh, you talking about both your accomplishments and your goals uh, as you conceive of the next stretch of time for you in this uh, position. And I, I want to thank you for that. It's important to me. And as uh, a member serving in the Senate, it is important to Minnesotans. 
uh, and I'm grateful uh, that you are lifting those issues up um, and talking about both your accomplishments and what you hope for. Uh, with that, members, are there questions uh, for this commissioner before we take action on her confirmation? Senator Swadzinski. Thank you, Commissioner. That list of accomplishments, um, very impressive. But the one that perked my interest, if you don't mind, like a one to two minute answer to this, uh, I think maybe your greatest accomplishment was keeping that eighth congressional congressional seat by 26 votes and I didn't even realize that that was in the purview of your um, office so if you could just explain uh, um, to a, a government teacher how we were able to beat New York I believe um, and keep that eighth spot so because that's a nice compliment. Commissioner uh, Roberts Davis. Madam Chair, uh, Senator we had a complete count committee that was established. There were three co-chairs of myself, um, Jonathan Weinhagen, um, also Sharon Sales Belton, uh, who all worked together to ensure that there was uh, the appropriate level of oversight for how the state demographer was leading the complete count. Um, there was a tremendous amount of partnership with community organizations that we put in place at the very beginning. Uh, working really diligently to make sure that they understood the mission of the state and how, uh, how close we were to losing that congressional seat during the last decennial census as well. And so we knew that there was a challenge that we had to meet. Uh, it was a very uh, difficult challenge because when we first started with our complete count committee work, we, um, we didn't anticipate a, a pandemic as well. So we had a lot of plans around, like, like anybody of course, but we had a lot of plans around how we would get out into community how we would do door knocking, how we would uh, activate Minnesotans, and none of that was possible uh, due to the pandemic. And so uh, with the, the leadership of our state demographer, Susan Brower, who really did a phenomenal job uh, with a very small team, we continued on with as much as we could as far as outreach. We did a lot of direct mailing. There was still some door knocking that happened, but um, uh, at the end of the day, it really was just grassroots organization with communities that helped us get a uh, complete count done. Senator Swazinski, thank you. Senator Lang. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, Senator Swazinski uh, piqued a question. Um, you know, we've had quite a bit of conversations about Minnesota losing population over the last well, a couple of years, realistically, and we think we lost 100,000 people. Do, do we earn that seat? <laughs> you know, it's kind of an interesting question. Like, can we maintain that seat as we go forward over the next 10 years? Or right now, does that, if it was to happen today, would we, would we have that seat? Commissioner Roberts Davis. Madam Chair, Senator, that is a great question. It's a great question for the state demographer to answer. She'd be able to answer that better than I would. Um, but I think that what we're seeing is a lot of changes in population patterns around the country. And so I don't know that today if we would, uh, if we would meet it or not, but you have to agree that 26 is a very slim margin. So. Thank you, Senator Lang. Are there further questions? Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner. So along the lines of Senator Lang's question, so Minnesota is one of a variety of states that were overcounted. I think ours is almost by 4%. Can you describe or, to us why we were overcounted by almost 225,000 people? Uh, Commissioner Roberts Davis. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Corona, I don't know the answer to that. I, I honestly don't. I would have to work with the state demographer to get you an answer, but I'm not sure exactly how that how that might have occurred if it did. Madam Chair, just a quick follow. Senator Corona. So, um, Commissioner, so this came right from the Census Bureau. The the state, the six states that were uh, undercounted, and the eight states we were one of them that were overcounted. I assume you got that report. Commissioner. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm sure that I did. Senator Coran. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, We're good. You, thank you, Senator Coran, and thank you, Commissioner. And uh, if we need to come back to this topic uh, to make sure that we are uh, reflecting the work that was done, uh, we, we are happy to do that. Um, and we can follow up with the state demographer. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there further questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Roberts Davis, uh, in your position, uh, you came from Target uh, as a group manager for supplier diversity, 
And then in your mission statement, you have values, partnership, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then in your priorities, you have partner, service and satisfaction, agency culture, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Is, was that part of your um, vision in, when you were with Target also, as far as those values and priorities? Commissioner Roberts Davis, um, Madam Chair, Senator, uh, yes, one of the group manager positions that I held was as a supplier diversity um, leader. It was a key management group position within the organization, and uh, the entire organization's priorities were around uh, equity and, and customers and making sure that we were reflecting the customers and the guests who shopped in the store. So, yes, that was a, a key focal point um, during that role, particularly in that role um, because we were working with diverse business owners to ensure that they had opportunities to sell their merchandise in Target stores. So um, that was a priority, and I, I brought a lot of what I learned at Target into my role here at the state. It's really shaped the way that I look at things. I, I think about the culture of our agency um, and wanting it to be a great place to work. I think about diversity and inclusion as a um, cornerstone of how we do our work and uh, making sure that we are reflecting the needs of all Minnesotans. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Roberts Davis, uh, it says here also that you were responsible for the state's equity in procurement and procurement technical S assistance center. What is that? Commissioner, uh, Madam Chair, thank you for that question because these are um, really uh, meaningful divisions within the agency for me. One of the reasons that I came to the state was to stand up the Office of Equity and Procurement. Um, that is a division of six people who are responsible for working directly with business owners to help them understand the benefits of becoming a vendor for the state of Minnesota. They um, work with women, minorities, people with substantial physical disabilities, and veterans. Um, and show them how to get into our system. They also work with state agencies to help them better understand the benefits of working with a small targeted group business. We've done tremendous work in that space. We've lifted uh, spend with targeted group businesses from less than 4% to 9% in the last seven years. Um, our work with veterans has been unprecedented. We've become a national benchmark for a lot of other states on the work that we do. Uh, and we've um, increased our spend to $148 million with businesses. Uh, specifically with um, veterans, we've increased the number of veteran-owned businesses as well because of a program that we implemented that allowed them, if they were federally certified, to become directly state certified. And so tremendous success for the veteran community as well. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Roberts Davis, um, it says here that you uh, uh, diverse spending with the state's minority, women, and veteran-owned business. Can you give us examples of all three of those that you have actually uh, seen take place under your reign? Absolutely. Commissioner. Uh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, a woman-owned business that I would highlight is Innovative Office Solutions. They do all of the state's uh, office supplies. A minority-owned business that I would highlight would be um, um, Rick Harris's uh, furniture business. We do a great deal of work with him. Ideal Interiors is the name of his business. We also work with a gentleman by the name of Mark Harris, who has his own business as well, and he's done a number of different types of business. He, also, he did office supplies for a while, and now he's uh, pivoted his business to better serve the state and other uh, supply needs that we have. Um, for veteran-owned businesses, I can't name a specific veteran-owned business, although I believe that the, um, I can't think of the name of it, but they are a um, millwork company. I believe it's Eagle Erectors, but uh, I can get the name for you specifically. Uh, and they do a lot of construction and millwork for the state. Thank you very much, Senator Anderson. Are there further questions uh, for this commissioner? Seeing no further questions, uh, is there a motion before us? Senator Gustafson. 
Madam Chair, I move to recommend the confirmation of appointment of Alice Roberts Davis to be Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Administration. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, the question before us is the confirmation of this commissioner. Are there any questions specifically to the motion? Seeing no questions, Senator Carlson? Senator Carlson. And the destination is to the floor. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we would be uh, moving this confirmation from this committee with a unanimous vote, with a vote, uh, a positive vote, uh, then to the floor. Seeing no questions, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those opposed, please say no. I let the record show that that was a unanimous voice vote. Congratulations, uh, and thank you so much uh, for what you are doing for the state of Minnesota. We have high expectations for you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. All right. I'd like to invite uh, Deputy Commissioner Britta Raitan. Uh, up to talk with us from the Department of Minnesota Management and Budget. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please uh, you know, state your name for the record and uh, begin your presentation. Again, we have about 20 minutes uh, for uh, an overview um, and about 10 minutes for questions. Thank you, Senator. I'm just going to take one moment to make sure this is up on the screen, which it's not looking like it is. <laughs> and for committee members, uh, you will be getting the PowerPoint presentations. Uh, uh, they're being distributed by the pages as soon as we have them, as far as I know. And we have a little technical difficulty, so we're going to figure that out. Oh, there we go. There we go. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Senator and members. Uh, my name is Britta Rayton. I am Deputy Commissioner uh, over Operations at Minnesota Management and Budget. Um, I really appreciate uh, the time with all of you today. Uh, Commissioner Showalter uh, can't join us today. We have a, a budget uh, release happening um, this afternoon, um, but I'm sure he will be um, in front of you in the future. Um, but again, thank you for the opportunity to present an overview of our agency, uh, Minnesota Management and Budget. I believe you have the slide deck in front of you, uh, but this first slide provides an overview of our mission, vision, and values as an agency, as well as our agency goals. Uh, the commissioner of MMB really serves as the, the chief financial officer for the state, the controller for the state, the treasurer, as well as the Chief Human Resources Officer and Chief Recruiter. Um, so it's a pretty broad scope uh, that we cover at MMB. Turning to the next slide, we really provide foundational services that are the backbone for all state government programs. So for every agency, board, and commission, and really for all three branches of government. And we achieve that through a broad scope of work, from accounting, budgeting, debt management, financial reporting, as well as overseeing human resource policy, our insurance and benefit program, improving our employee recruitment and retention, and providing enterprise-wide training on our human resources side of our operations. MMB also provides service support and leadership in other ways to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of state government. And that includes evaluating program effectiveness by our results team at MMB, as well as convening and coordinating to create cross-agency solutions by the children's cabinet staff that's also housed within MMB. I want to highlight that we provide this broad scope of work with just 270 full-time uh, employees at MMB. And this slide really gives a quick snapshot of the scope of work and the volume of the work that we do. And whenever uh, I land on this slide, it's, it's uh, a little uh, surprising just to how much uh, quantity can be produced by the 270 FTEs at MMB. But we do issue about 49,000 vendor payments a week out of our accounting team. 
We process uh, biweekly payroll checks for the entire state enterprise through our payroll team. Um, our budget team really coordinates the budget work for all 100 state entities uh, during the budget process. And of course, our debt management team is overseeing and managing over $8 billion in debt. Um, you all know our economic analysis team, as you see the forecast, twice a year. They come forward with our, our revenue projections twice a year. That's done by our small economic analysis team. And then our employee insurance team manages benefits for over 132,000 employees, their family, and, their, and retirees as well. And then MMB also has a um, enterprise communications team that uh, sends out over 100 employee-centered messages um, throughout a year. Turning more to how MMB is funded, um, this, gives a nec this next slide is giving a context uh, for our financial resources that MMB is directly managing. And we manage not just our own operating budget, which is a very small piece of the pie. As you can see, it's just 2% of the pie you're seeing, but also our statewide debt service payments, our enterprise-wide insurance benefit payments, and other payments that MMB manages on behalf of the state state enterprise that we refer to as non-operating payments. So somewhat similar to admin where, where they had passed through payments to other entities, um, much of the money that we manage is not about MMB's own operations. It's just that 2% of the pie. So our own agency budget is about $56 million annually. Roughly half of that spending is from the general fund. The other half is funded through enterprise billing and internal service funds. So as you can see from the chart, our spending on IT as well as our enterprise resource planning system is the biggest piece of our, our pie in our operating budget. And really that piece of the pie is to support the backbone systems of state government enterprise wide. So this is our accounting and HR systems, our learning management systems, our data warehouse system that's used enterprise-wide. Um, a portion of that comes from MMB's own general fund, and $10 million of that is billed annually to our agencies statewide to pay into the, the functioning of that system. Also want to point out that the second largest piece of the spending is, is listed as our communications planning and MAD division. I should probably explain what MAD means. Um, and MAD is our management analysis division. So the, the biggest uh, portion of that 18% is really the budget for our management analysis division. This is a nationally recognized fee-for-service management consulting group at MMB and, and other agencies can contract with Man, our management analysis division to help them solve um, tricky problems in their own agency. Um, so it's, it's like a consulting practice within MMB. So that gives kind of an overview of our agency and the broad scope of our work. But I wanted to end with some of our recent accomplishments as an agency. Um, as I mentioned, MMB has a relatively small but mighty team of dedicated public servants, and they, they do tremendous work. So in the last year, the state of Minnesota received the highest bond rating from all three credit rating agencies. Uh, this is a testament to the strong fiscal management of state government, also to our healthy levels of reserves, careful budgeting, and financially sound decision making uh, by the state legislature and the governor and lieutenant governor. So really, um, as we go to the credit rating agencies each year, they are looking at our reserve levels, our budget management, but also our ability to come together and, and pass a budget successfully. Um, additionally, through our work managing federal and state funds um, through the pandemic, MMB partnered with state agencies to pursue as much federal FEMA reimbursement wherever possible. As a result, uh, MMB successfully returned over $300 million in state appropriations that were originally appropriated out of the general fund for COVID back to the general fund because we were able to seek federal reimbursement on our spend as well as uh, seek federal reimbursement on some of our early uh, federal dollars um, through the ARP and CRF and kind of uh, 
recycle those funds back to relieve the general fund, which uh, generated over $300 million over $300 million in savings to the general fund. Uh, also, our results team at MMB has been nationally recognized for its work. Uh, results for America ranks Minnesota in the top seven states for effectively using data and evidence to achieve better outcomes for its residents. Uh, recently, this team evaluated uh, a state program regarding opioid treatment, and that uh, evaluation and research paper was published in the Journal of American Medical Association's Health Forum. Um, and we can provide that to you if you would like, but they're really um, kind of on the front lines of pushing uh, good work on e evaluating the effectiveness of programming. Um, the Children's Cabinet has also provided tremendous work convening agencies from across the enterprise to improve services for Minnesota families. Recently, their efforts with other cabinet agencies allowed for Medicaid direct certification of families for free and reduced cost meals. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so we at MNB are... Um, are proud of the work the Children's Cabinet has done with their partner agencies to cut through that red tape so that nearly 200,000 families can now receive this benefit without completing cumbersome paperwork. And finally, our Enterprise Employee Resources Team increased employee uh, participation in CGIP, our health insurance program. Um, this team also supports our employee development and enhanced staff knowledge uh, through our enterprise training uh, and talent development program. Um, that's another program housed within MMB where we provide services across the enterprise um, to do training and talent, talent development across the enterprise. That's another uh, fee-for-service or internal service fund supported effort that we do. Uh, and with that, Madam Chair, that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Commissioner Raytan. Senator Lang has a question. You're up first. <laughs> Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple questions. I think it was on slide six. You talked about the debt service um, being a pretty big chunk of 51% uh, mm -hmm. of the sound like, so roughly $1.8 billion. Um, can you tell me how much of that debt service is actually interest payments? Ooh, I, I don't, don't know that number. 3% give or take? Is that, <laughs> is that pretty re realistic? Well, uh, Senator Lang, I don't know the number off the top of my head. I don't want to guess, um, but I can certainly get that answer. We have an assistant commissioner over debt management, Jennifer Hassamer. I can talk to her about okay. what portion of our payments are principal versus what portion are interest. Um, this is you know, debt we've issued over the last 10 to 20 years, um, so it would be based on the interest um, at the time that we issued those bonds, although we do refinance bonds over the, t over the course of time, so I can certainly get you that answer. And, Sen uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess that kind of goes to my question, and we're sitting on a huge surplus, and we oftentimes bond for about what we're paying in debt service. That's kind of the, the theme, because that's what we can afford, or we see that we can afford. Do you know, uh, on an annual basis, I guess the question is, if we were to pay cash for one of these bills when we're sitting on a, a big surplus, what would be the savings of the state? Deputy Commissioner. Uh, Senator Lang, well, it would depend on the interest, uh, the, the level of interest at the time we sold the bonds. Um, and so currently, um, when, we, when we pass a bonding bill, we don't sell all the bonds immediately. We sell the bonds based on when the projects that we are bonding for are actually planning to spend those dollars. And so they do an evaluate, each project does an evaluation of their cash flow, and then our debt management team um, does the work of determining when we actually need to go to the market to sell those bonds. Um, so I don't have that answer off the top of my head. That's another one I can certainly ask based on our forecasted interest rates going forward and our typical spend down of a, of a, a bonding bill. Senator Lang, thank you. <laughs> And Deputy Commissioner, when you do have the answer to Senator Lang's first question, if you could share that with me, I, I'll make sure and get it to everybody on the committee in addition to um, Senator Lang. That would be helpful. I'd like uh, us to all have the same information. Are there other questions for the Deputy Commissioner? Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair and Deputy Commissioner um, Rattan. So you're going to, uh, you, you mentioned you, 
of course, you guys negotiate the, the state contracts. And so it appears that most businesses are going to be mandated to carry a pretty sizable uh, paid family and, and medical leave program. And so we already offer that within the states, but you're going to have a tremendous amount of pressure to add the same criteria to the current state con or the contract you're about to negotiate or in the middle of. Um, would love to know, um, one, are those elements in play? Two, how are we going to pay for them? And then three, you may not have any of these answers, but as we move forward, we certainly want to understand what impact to the workforce you believe that's going to have. And then fourth piece is on who's going to pay for it. Will it, will it follow the same policies and procedures that will be imposed on businesses that it's a shared expense between employees and the employer, or will the proposal be to absorb it with a by state taxpayers. Deputy Commissioner, uh, please you know, proceed, uh, but also know that this bill, paid family and medical leave, will be for this committee uh, later this week, uh, and I'm sure we'll have then a thorough investigation, examination, lots of questions, and of course, if you'd like to be here then as well, you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Coran, I believe our fiscal note speaks to that. I don't have our fiscal note in front of me, uh, but I will make sure we have someone that can speak to the impact on state government for the hearing that's upcoming. Thank you for the preview, Senator Curran. Are there other questions? I, I had one for you. Um, you mentioned, um, and I remember this in the news, uh, our bond rating for the state of Minnesota. Um, and I know uh, we like to be at the top of all the lists, uh, so that's good uh, in this case. Uh, but can you talk with me and with the committee a little bit about what happens when our bond rating is not um, at the top of the list? But, and, and are there occasions in Minnesota when we have dipped below uh, the top of the ratings when it comes to a bond rating and what that means for our fiscal health? Uh, Madam Chair and members, so our, we, we just recently now achieved the top bond ratings from all three rating agencies. We haven't been in that space for, I think it was early 2000s, the last time we were. Um, we did have a, a AAA rating from two of the rating agencies uh, for a couple of years and then finally got the third um, this last summer. It, it really depends, um, frankly, how how far you are from AAA, how much impact it has on the interest rates you get on your, on your debt sale. Um, so I, I wouldn't say we've ever been in, um, you know, territory where our bond rating has been low, um, but it is certainly preferential to have the top bond rating. Thank you. And then one follow-up question. Uh, you mentioned uh, the children's cabinet and cutting red tape. And I'm just wondering if you could share with the committee the tools you used to cut the red tape. Um, thank you for the questions, uh, Senator Murphy. So in that case, it was really about direct certifying um, children and families for free and reduced lunch when they already were qualifying for another public program that made them eligible for free and reduced lunch. Uh, so. Um, on that front, uh, what, how that works, or how that work was executed was really working across agencies, making sure we, we know how we can share data and make systems share data, um, and uh, ensuring that we're, we are making it simpler for families and for Minnesotans to access the services that they need. Right. I appreciate that. Are there further questions for the Deputy Commissioner? All right. I think you're off the hot seat. Thank you. Thank you. And next, uh, I'd like to invite up uh, Deputy Commissioner Lee Ho from the Department of Revenue. Uh, similar overview. Welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record. Share with us your perspective. We're going to have some questions for you. And for committee members, you probably know this, but the commissioner for MMB uh, and that confirmation is being taken up in the Finance Committee. Uh, similarly, the Commissioner for Revenue will be taken up or has been taken up uh, in the Tax Committee. Um, welcome to the Committee, Deputy Commissioner. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me and giving us the opportunity to speak before the Committee. For the record, my name is Lee Ho, Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Revenue. 
With me is Shane Delaney, Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Agency Planning and Performance. Just starting with the basics about the agency, our basic purpose according to statute is to administer and enforce the assessment and collection of taxes. We like to think of it at the agency level and really try to emphasize that we're here to fund the future for all of Minnesota. And it's really important to us. And one of the other principles that we have is really to achieve tax equity. And that's really developed in our vision statement, which is really that everybody reports and pays the right amount of tax, no more, no less. And we really, we really try to strive for that. You know, as you can see, there's over $33 billion in taxes that we collect, and over half of that is individual income tax, and 80% of it is between individual sales tax and corporate tax. Uh, just a point of note on this slide, statewide property tax is only a small part of the property tax system, and that's the part that we're responsible for collecting. You know, as we talk about the $33 billion, we're really here to support the funding required for education, infrastructure, things like public safety, health, as well as natural resources and transportation. And in addition to that, we also supply aids to different locations. Over $1 billion in aids are paid out each year. About $564 million of that is local government aid, and approximately $264 million of that is county aid. The department serves a broad base of customers ranging from individuals and businesses. We have over 3 million individual income tax returns, and we also have about 3 million returns of other types from businesses and other entities. You know, when we look at our customers, one of the things we think about is our customers are not just individuals, but they're also members of the military, their families, their farmers, their seniors. And so we have a fairly diverse set of customers that we deal with, and we try to think about how we communicate and educate them to help make sure that the tax system works smoothly and effectively. One of the other customers we have are local governments in the counties and cities. There are approximately 100 of them that have local option sales taxes, and we collect over $450 million a year for those communities. We also see our responsibility in advising the governor and the legislature about good tax policy and the best ways to be more efficient and effective in administering those policies. One of those roles with the legislature is really supporting the tax committee and providing them the information they need to better understand what's happening, whether it's revenue estimates or property tax um, information, so people know what is happening within the system. We also rely on a number of partners in, the, in managing the system. As you know, it's a voluntary compliance system, so that means that it, individuals, businesses, and many others are responsible for contributing to the success of the system. And part of the way we do that is through education. So we have a number of education events we conduct every year, about 200 of them, to help make sure people have the information they need in order to meet their tax obligations. We also try to work with customers when things change in the tax system. For example, when we had different levels of conformity around unemployment insurance and the paycheck protection program loans that were forgiven. Uh, during that time, we adjusted about 540,000 returns in order to help uh, those taxpayers uh, get the benefits that they needed without as much impact on them. We have two offices that we've um, established. One is in statute, the Taxpayer Rights Advocate, who's responsible for helping taxpayers who need assistance that maybe are, go beyond the normal channels that the department provides. We also have an Office of Public Engagement to help us build relationship with different taxpayer groups and communities so that we can help make sure the tax system is meeting a broad cross-section of needs. The department, the demographics of the department, we have a, more than 1,400 employees and we administer somewhere between 30 and 40 tax types depending on how you count them. 
We have approximately $188 million annual budget, and about 75% of that is for our people, about 15% of that is for technology, and the other 10% is for things like mailing and rent costs. So one of the things I would like to point out is most of the people that think about the Department of Revenue think about the individual taxes and the individual tax season, and that's literally about half of our work. The rest of the work is actually um, conducted throughout the year, and it's really interacting with business taxes for sales tax, withholding tax, and other types of taxes. So as we think about tax administration, one of the things that's a priority for the agency is really trying to minimize the impact of taxes on our customers. You know, we know this is a voluntary system and it's really important for the system to work smoothly and effectively in order to help taxpayers comply and to minimize the, the difficulty with people paying their taxes. So we do provide a lot of assistance to taxpayers and preparers you know, and our goal is really to protect the integrity of the tax system. As you can see from this diagram, we literally spend from the better part of the year after the legislative session helping plan and prepare for the following tax year. So a number of things are done to really analyze tax laws that are passed during session and really update forms and instructions. And we work with a lot of our stakeholders in order to make sure that the system works as well for them as it does for us. We also do a lot of testing with software providers. You know, one of the things that we do starting early in August, once we know what, which direction the tax system is evolving, is we have a number of feedback loops around forms, instructions, requirements, and ultimately a series of tests that we conduct both with the federal system as well as our software providers to ensure that the system works effectively for individual tax when it rolls out at the beginning of the year. Um, in your packets, I believe, you should have a handout that, is, that looks like this. These are descriptions of the workflow that's involved with processing individual income tax returns and property tax refunds. One of the things I would identify for you is, as you look at the electronic path, which is in blue, it involves much less friction of things that are going on than paper returns. And so that's one of the things that is really important to us and the system in general to be able to bring in as, many, as much of the information as possible electronically. I also want to highlight how important security is to us. We know that there's increasing incidents of identity theft and refund fraud, and so those are things that we're constantly on the, paying attention to, and we're also mindful that we need to protect taxpayer information, and that's really important to us. So we do a lot of uh, security training for our employees as well as providing information to tax preparers and taxpayers. The general work of the department is really encompassed by the group of people listed on this um, slide. They, these are people that provide education and assistance to taxpayers. They do policy development and support. They engage customers. They also enforce compliance with um, tax laws. As far as our operations, we're continually, as an agency, looking for ways to meet increasing costs by becoming more efficient. So in the past few years, we've been, general, uh, we've been gradually reducing our office footprint, especially with the ability for us to increase the amount of telework within the agency. We've also been managing printing and mailing costs by trying to move things more electronically where we can interact with taxpayers in a different method. You know, we've also been trying to use other forms of technology to reach out to taxpayers in ways that we couldn't before, where in the, in the past we've had more personal interactions. We've been trying to do more things virtually so taxpayers that are not within reach of a revenue location have more ability to interact with us. One of the ongoing things for us is really an evolution and transformation that we've been making to uh, get the benefits of using telework in our environment. 
We found as we've been inter interacting with the tight labor market that we've been able to more broadly recruit and retain employees from across the state, and that's enabled us to really reach out and find a more diverse population of employees. And it's one of the top questions we're asked by most job applicants is, do you offer some sort of hybrid option for us to work? Yeah, approximately 80 to 85% of our employees are currently teleworking, and then many of those use the office as business needs require. Uh, security, as I mentioned earlier, is top of the mind, and that's one of the things that we really try to strive for when we have a teleworking population. And we use most of the latest technologies around virtual private networking and really having multi-factor authentication and encrypting all the, all the data that is in transmission or arrest throughout this process. And so it's something we take very seriously. And we also have the ability to manage our employee interactions through the tax system that we use that tracks records and interactions with um, customer data. I do want to thank our partners in a lot of the work that we do. One of them is Minute, who uh, helps advise us and, and work with us on computer and data security. We also do a lot of work with MMB on reporting and forecasting. And we work with the Department of Administration to help us distribute paper mail as well as manage facilities. Uh, I do also want to recognize the Department of Employment and Economic Development that does print checks for us. So we do not have a facility to print our own checks. We essentially send electronic files, and the state um, has a centralized facility to print in that, in that department. So I want to thank the committee for the time you've provided us to speak today, and we're open to taking questions. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Ho. I appreciate you and uh, this presentation. Uh, I see hands moving, so I suspect there are questions from the committee. Senator Dreskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Ho. Uh, we did... Um, uh, entertain discussion uh, and uh, around Commissioner Marquardt's uh, confirmation and uh, there, there actually was unanimous uh, approval. I don't know if we had it last time, Madam Chair, here or not. Uh, I, I was kind of taken back by the th that fact that it was categorized as, as unanimous. Uh, some of us may not have voted last time. Uh -huh. uh, but we did on the tax committee have, have unanimous approval of Commissioner Marquardt. Uh, and I, I, I think we'll get, well, we expect really good things from him. Commissioner Ho, um, one thing that uh, I'm concerned about, uh, 80 to 85% telework. And I've had mu personally multiple experiences with performance issues where people are, are operating remotely. And I understand that it's helping you um, acquire more employees that way or easily, more easily do it in a difficult job market. But tell us, if you will, what is it you are doing to make certain that we're getting performance out of the 85% of the 1,400 employees that are working from their homes, some of them in their jammies? Deputy Commissioner Ho. So, Madam Chair, Senator Draskowski, one of the advantages that we have at the Department of Revenue is a lot of our work is quantity-based as well as it has a quality dimension, and it's, and it's measured in, in numbers, you know, volumes of tax returns, numbers of audits dollars collected, things like that, that give us the ability to really monitor the performance of our employees and really understand what they're doing. We also have within our tax system the ability to manage the interactions and to manage and look at the volumes of work that people are performing and which returns they're actually interacting with. And we have um, a supervisory workforce that really understands how that system works and is able to really interact with the employees and understand who's performing what work and are they doing what they're expecting to do. And so we can actually even look at um, vi visual screenshots of things that people are doing so we have a better understanding of how the work is being done and we're able to monitor and track it. Thank you. Senator thank, Jeskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Ho. Um, that's, from what I can hear, that's encouraging. Um, I, I hope uh, that uh, you use that, what sounds like a very good process. I hope you use it robustly, because uh, I don't have a great deal of trust for 
uh, remote work and we're seeing trends in, in the private sector that are bringing people back to the workplace because of that. So I hope your agency continues to monitor that well. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator Draskowski. Are there other questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner, uh, Deputy Commissioner Ho. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, you've got 1,400 employees in your employee underneath your preview. Um, I was listening to the Center for the American Experiment just in the last month and a half or so saying that over 20,000 Minnesotans have left the state of Minnesota. Uh, has that impacted the number uh, as far as uh, work that you have? Have you seen a reduction in your workload? Deputy Commissioner. Madam Chair, Senator Anderson, We've actually seen a slight increase in our work, and I'm not sure how that relates to the number, the number of people that have left Minnesota, but it may be the number of businesses that are starting up, or it may be the number of individuals that are, are whose incomes have reached the threshold where they're now reporting their finances to us. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Mike, uh, CPA, CPA recommended that I pay my taxes in advance uh, based on my previous year pay, payment of taxes to the state of Minnesota. I'm wondering, do you send back a, a notice that you've received uh, the payment in your, at your facility there here in St. Paul? Deputy Commissioner Hall. Madam Chair, Senator Anderson, I believe if you make advance payments through, the, through our system, we send a confirmation email if you put an email there. I know that I recently made a payment myself and I received confirmation of that. So uh, I, it depends on how you make the payment. But in general, I think, believe our system responds to you to let you know that payments were made. Oh, Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Mr. Hall, uh, I did not make it online. I did a, a check out of my savings account to directly to the Department of Revenue. So I have not received anything back yet to confirm that my taxes have been paid in advance. Deputy Commissioner Ho, would you and the people that you work with uh, follow up with Senator Anderson about uh, his payment? We will, thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions? Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair. You'd feel left out if I didn't ask one, right? Um, Commissioner Ho, it's good. I'm glad you put a plug in for the, the electronic file, you know, the electronic payment. You get an automatic acknowledgement. So um, I'll help work with Senator Anderson to, to bring him over to the other side. Um, but on the, uh, on the mobile workforce, you know, you, you've, I've, uh, I've tracked this for a while since I've gotten here, and I know revenue, we've always had, heck, we had, I think, 14 remote offices at some point when we were... Uh, um, back way back in the day when we worked together. So of the mobile workforce today, um, we had a variety of corporate audit which were geographically located and, and absolutely functional. How many, how many uh, employees do you have now that no longer reside in the state of Minnesota? Just from the Department of Revenue. Deputy Commissioner Hull. Madam Chair, Senator Cran, I'm guessing it's less than 10. Um, we do have a number of employees that are located in other states for reasons that we have businesses there that we do ongoing tax work with. So I'm not including those. Um, and I, I'm not including the people in Wisconsin as well. We have a number of people that are in border states. Um, so I'm thinking it's somewhere in a, it's a very small number and most of those are really actually working on specific audit engagements over a particular region and other parts of the country. We don't have normal, you know, it's like what our routine work um, employees working out of state at this time. Senator Thank you, Madam Graham. Chair. I'm good. Thank you, Senator Thank you, Graham. Commissioner. Thank you. Are there other questions? Senator Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In response to Senator Coran, I have to go along with Senator Driskowski and his distrust of what's going on in government. So I play the field, even though it may mean I'm not progressive enough, uh, Senator Coran, but uh, I think that Senator Druskowski and I are both on the same page. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Anderson. And the good news is that there is room for everyone to make their choices. Thank God. <laughs> Thank you. 
Are there further questions? And Senator Jaskowski, um, thank you for the clarification. I appreciated that. All right. Deputy Commissioner Ho and all, thank you very much for being here. Uh, you're off the half seat. Uh, the last work of our committee hearing today is hearing from Minute. Uh, and we're going to hear from both uh, Deputy Commissioner John Eichton, who is with us, and eventually from Commissioner Tomes, who is on his way uh, from an event with the governor. Uh, and we will take up uh, with the committee's time that has left uh, that commissioner's confirmation. So Deputy Commissioner, uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, when you're ready, uh, please introduce yourself and proceed to your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and for the record, my name is John Eichton. I'm uh, Minnesota IT Services uh, Deputy Commissioner. Now let's just start the slideshow here. Let's take note that it is IT that is struggling with that technology right now. <laughs> I, I'm used to that one. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Well, uh, thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. As I said, I'm Minutes Deputy Commissioner. Uh, I'll provide the agency overview. Uh, and as the as Madam Chair, as you said, uh, Commissioner Tomes is on his way from the budget rollout and should be here shortly. So. Uh, we at Minnesota IT Services, uh, you'll see on this slide some, some big numbers. For those of you who um, may not know some of the history, Minnesota IT Services was created about 11 years ago when the 2011 legislature passed the IT consolidation law. Uh, this was uh, an, an accomplishment of uh, Representative Keith Downey and Representative Phyllis Kahn at the time who, if you recall, uh, hugged on the House floor upon passage of the bill for something that uh, they could agree upon for once because they, they weren't accustomed to agreeing on much. Uh, but since that time, uh, Minute has been working to uh, centralize, to consolidate, uh, and to improve the, the effectiveness and the security of the information technology uh, that supports the whole of the executive branch. In that, we support about 35,000 end users, so state employees, uh, who are uh, informa information workers to some degree. Uh, those folks work for over 70 uh, state agencies, boards, councils, and commissions. So everywhere from the big agencies of uh, MnDOT and a DHS uh, down to one t person, two person, uh, ombudsperson offices, uh, councils, uh, the barber board, uh, the, the board of nursing, kind of the whole gamut of cabinet and non-cabinet. Uh, within that environment, there are roughly 2,500 applications, so software applications that are either you know, off-the-shelf applications or custom-developed in-house applications that we work to support. Um, we also support a statewide network, uh, so a fiber optic uh, network that connects all 87 counties, all the uh, higher education institutions, as well as all the state agency office locations. We refer to that as MNET, and it's, it's one of the significant assets that we have as a state relative to other states that we have a, a shared uh, public sector network. It doesn't mean we own the fiber in the ground. We, we are a broker and we work with uh, private sector companies throughout the state, some big, some small, especially in greater Minnesota, to put together that uh, highly secure network. We, ha we have about 400 projects in the IT project portfolio, so some of those projects are within our central service delivery organization, uh, kind of the boring stuff like uh, network and hosting and, and email and phones. Uh, and then the remainder are out in our agencies because we have staff who work to deliver those commodity centralized services as well as staff who are based in DHS, DOT, and other agencies uh, working on really business sp specific applications and driving the programs and services that those agencies provide. The budget for that work, that agency-based activity, is about 400 million. Uh, about 200 million goes to the centralized services side of the operation. Uh, in terms of uh, measuring our, our satisfaction, that's something that we con continue to encourage our agency business partners to do. And so we eat our own dog food in that we, we assess how satisfied are the state agency employees with the services that we're providing them and happy to see a, a 4.7 out of uh, five rating in that regard. And then we uh, have the enterprise cybersecurity function. Uh, in, within the last year, detected, resolved over 1,000 security incidents. 
Uh, it's a big number, but it was much bigger in previous years, and I'll talk a little bit about the investments this body made to help bring that number down. Our mission, deliver secure, reliable technology so solutions to improve the lives of Minnesotans, and our long-term vision is for an innovative digital government that works for all, whether you interact with the government uh, over the phone or mailing in a check, or whether you do that online, whether you have a, a, a perhaps a a vision impairment, a disability of some kind that makes it more challenging to interact with our online services, uh, whether you're a county worker who is a partner with us in delivering services such as those at DHS, or a deputy registrar uh, who's working to deliver driver and vehicle services, not a state employee, but one of our, our close partners and, and a, a user from the lens of IT that uh, we seek to center our solutions around. Two of the guiding principles I just wanna point out, or actually three at the bottom here, embrace change, Measure when you can and engage with empathy. Uh, the world of technology is constantly changing. Uh, we need to be agents of that change, be open to it, help our business partners embrace it and look for opportunities uh, to improve their work. Uh, and as an information organization, there are lots of things we can measure, both in terms of quality and quantity, and we seek to do that uh, through the work we do to understand how effectively are we meeting our mission. And then the point about empathy might be a little strange coming from the IT guy, but uh, when we talk about human-centered design, when we talk about improving the customer experience, that starts with uh, baking empathy uh, into every aspect our, of our work and our business partners' work, understanding the various journeys that Minnesotans and businesses, county workers take interacting with us, and then focusing the enhancements that we make to technology around those users' needs and pain points. Uh, just our, our strategic goals, I won't uh, dwell too long there. The one that I will just clarify, when we the fourth one there in the blue box, elevate Minnesota's digital estate. We're talking there about the vast amounts of information and data uh, that the state holds and truly leveraging the power of that information to inform better policy making uh, and more targeted interventions and improved, more effective services. Uh, this body may have talked some about the, the Technology Advisory Council. This was previously the Blue Ribbon Commission on, on IT. Chair of this group is Rick King. Uh, Governor Walls appointed the BRC uh, very early in, in his administration. The legislature then acted to put this, in, uh, make it a permanent body in, in statute. Uh, it includes private sector uh, CIO, technology leaders uh, from companies either currently or formerly uh, such as TCF, uh, Delta, um, Thomson Reuters. It also includes county and city representatives, state legislators, and then state agency business leaders. Uh, and this has really been uh, quite a unique uh, collection of folks when I go to the national conference once a year with other state IT organizations. Uh, it's kind of the envy of, uh, of, that, of some of those discussions because it, it really does bring together the policymakers with voices from the private sector uh, as well as the state agency folks who you know, have an intimate knowledge of the way the state runs to better leverage technology to improve services. And uh, we have a group within uh, the Minute organization now, the Transformation Strategy Delivery Office, that's really taking the lead in implementing the recommendations of the Technology Advisory Council, and uh, the council continues to meet on a monthly basis. It's a very active group. Uh, most recent report, uh, we will, you should have received in your inboxes, but we can certainly get you a paper copy as well. A lot of their recommendations are beyond the scope of technology and really about uh, business process redesign, statutory simplification, stakeholder engagement, uh, organizational change management, all of the components that have to go into a technology modernization effort to actually make it successful. It's much bigger than the technology. It's, it's about changing the way we work and doing that with our users at the center of our decision making. Uh, just to, few projects uh, to highlight from the, uh, 2022. As I said, the whole portfolio averages between 350 and 400 projects at any given time. 160 of those were completed in 2022. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the frontline worker pay program. Uh, technology stood up within months to provide uh, bonuses to frontline workers. Uh, similar pace of work occurred with the post 9-11 veteran service bonus. That was 60 days uh, to adapt an existing system to, to be able to deliver that bonus pay. Uh, to soldiers who served uh, after the uh, events of 9-11. Medicaid direct certification has been talked about a few times, just another instance of working across agency lines, breaking through silos. 
uh, to make the experience of Minnesotans, families easier, and ensuring that kids who qualify for Medicaid that are already qualified uh, for free and reduced lunch don't need to go through unnecessary paperwork to get that benefit provided. Min benefits is something that you're gonna hear minute uh, in other contexts as well, probably talk about repeatedly over the course of the, of the legislative session. I think it represents the North Star in terms of where we'd like to go. This was a replacement of Apply MN at the Department of Human Services, which was a pre-existing portal to apply for various DHS services. Uh, it took about 45 to 60 minutes to get through to apply for one program. In MN Benefits, we partnered with Code for America, who went, uh, interviewed, focus grouped, uh, a large number of county workers and customers of DHS to understand how can we make this better. Uh, through 83 releases, so consecutive software releases over the course of a year and a half, they honed a product uh, that is now enabling folks to apply for seven, uh, soon to be eight, I believe, distinct DHS programs like SNAP within eight minutes uh, without needing to create a login or a user ID. Uh, it, and they're also able to upload documents with their phone using the camera on their phone. It is Deputy Commissioner Chuck, Chuck Johnson, when he stepped out of his the deputy role, said it is the one thing that's been delivered that he's heard the most delight from, from the counties uh, in his, his entire uh, career at DHS, which you may know was a long one. I won't belabor the others, I'll continue through, but just it gives you a sense of, of some of those projects that we're most proud of, none of them delivered by minute alone, all of them delivered in partnership with various state agencies, whether it was DLI with Frontline or MDVA with the 9-11 service bonus. I talked about the application portfolio, which is, is really those business solutions that drive government, about 2,500 of them. Uh, we designate them, this is uh, a designation we have with MMB into, into uh, priority one, two, three, and four services, priority one. Life and safety are dependent on them. If they go down, they need to be up within 24 hours or there would be a life and safety impact from there. It goes down to significant economic impact and the like. We use these designations to uh, help our, our recovery planning in the event of a, a significant disaster uh, or a large scale ransomware attack, uh, for example. Of that portfolio, only 196 are currently cloud-based applications. The leader uh, in this arena within the executive branch is the Department of Health team. Uh, that team was the tip of the spear to the cloud. Uh, we do have a current initiative to continue to move more uh, applications into the public cloud, um, not our own private cloud, but the, the big public cloud providers. Uh, and we'll look forward to talking more about that initiative uh, in the weeks ahead. In terms of the cybersecurity threat landscape, uh, the governor did issue an executive order late last year that, that prioritized support for critical infrastructure that resulted in a 300% increase in providers who are registered with the Fusion Center, uh, which is over at the uh, Department of Public Safety to receive timely threat information. Here we're talking about uh, water service providers, uh, power companies, uh, companies involved in, in the, the food chain. Uh, those areas of critical infrastructure that uh, CISA has identified. We held a, a large scale cybersecurity tabletop exercise that was uh, called for within that executive order and established a cybersecurity task force to develop our statewide cyber plan, which is a prerequisite to uh, access the IJA dollars that the, the federal government has provided for state and local government. Those dollars uh, that would flow to the state via the state match, 80% would be to benefit local government, 20% is the max for state government. Uh, so another conversation we look forward to this session. We're also a uh, partner closely with the Secretary of State's office in terms of election security uh, and with federal government agencies uh, leading up to and through the general election. Uh, and it, in addition, uh, tied back to the, the governor's executive order, we've put an increased focus on addressing known exploited vulnerabilities. These are vulnerabilities that uh, have become just into, come just into the public's awareness and that we know bad actors are out there exploiting. We have uh, turnaround times for resolving those software vulnerabilities uh, based on their threat level and the, the extent to which we know they're being exploited. There are, there is not a, a limitless amount of resources and we need to target uh, those vulnerabilities that are most likely to uh, affect our operations. Uh, I'm, the number here, 1,000, 
uh, and six, which was the number of cyber incidents reported in 2022. Just to give you a sense of how that, that, dial, or how that number has come down in recent years, it was previously at uh, 1,835 in 2021 and 2,832 in 2020. Uh, but the funding that was provided in 2019 by the legislature, a $5 million per year investment, uh, has significantly moved the needle. It's done so through improved endpoint detection and response capabilities, improved de denial of service defenses. So when bad actors attempt to throw uh, an extreme amount of traffic at a website to take it down, uh, as well as funding phishing awareness training for state employees, uh, tools like multi-factor authentication and improved threat intelligence, uh, things like uh, phishing sites, uh, password dumps that we become aware of much more quickly and so we can take action proactively to prevent those from doing damage to our environment. It also enables to, us to purchase cyber insurance for all of the executive branch, all the consolidated executive agencies. Uh, even the fact that we were able to get that insurance is an indicator of the level of maturity that we've been able to gain in recent years. Many states would not even be quoted for that insurance because they, they simply can't demonstrate that they have the practices and processes in place uh, to prevent a large scale breach. Just to give you a sense quickly of how Minute works, we have, uh, as I said, an enterprise organization that shown at the top here. We have embedded Minute staff within each of the departments uh, shown here as DNR, MDA, and MMB. Uh, and we have leadership functions in areas like security and uh, technology accessibility for those with disabilities, geospatial technologies, mapping, uh, statewide address data sets uh, that are there to serve not just one, but a host of agencies that need uh, geographic information or to support their work, MinDOT, uh, agriculture, DNR, and others. In terms of IT funding, the vast, vast majority of our funding is, for, is fee for service via a chargeback model. About 2% is from the general fund or special revenue funds, and the remainder is through chargebacks for our services. We are um, not permitted to make a profit. We, we uh, establish rates for our uh, consolidated services based on the cost to deliver them divided by the volume that we forecast for the upcoming biennium. That forms our rate package and then agencies sometimes come to you with requests for operating adjustments that may be related to changes in our enterprise service rates uh, with volume and expenses going up or down from biennium to biennium. And then in terms of how our funds are spent, uh, roughly a half go to people, uh, about 20% to professional technical services. So think here about uh, contractors, vendors uh, for professional services, about 20% to software. Uh, that, that is meaning software that we buy from the, the market. And then you can see some additional smaller amounts there. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I do see the commissioners here. Uh, and so I would um, stand for any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Eichten. Are there questions for the Deputy Commissioner? Senator Fate. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Um, just looking at the funding and expenses portion of the presentation, um, I just had a question around salaries. Uh, can you touch on um, the salaries among the employees uh, versus uh, the tech world in the private sector? And um, what are you seeing within the agency? Are you seeing are we losing folks? Are we able to retain folks? What are you seeing? Deputy Commissioner Eichten. Thank you, Senator Fate and, and Madam Chair. I'll start with maybe the last question in terms of retention. We are proud of our retention rate uh, rating. Uh, we have about a 7% attrition rate, which compared to the, generally the private sector tech industry is quite low. Uh, I think a big portion of that is who's drawn to state employment to begin with, people who are seeking that sense of purpose and meaning from their work, and, and they know they could I, in many cases, not all, but in many cases be paid more in the private sector. I would say that we compete fairly well uh, in uh, more common roles, let's say, and uh, folks with less experience. As you get into more specialized roles, cloud engineers, um, security uh, leaders, security analysts, that's where we find a big challenge as well as at the more the executive level. I am often the one uh, combing through resumes trying to hire our, our agency-based chief business technology officers. And um, you know, it, is, it is a challenge at times to find you know, that right mix of a leader that we're looking for at the salary levels that we're uh, able to pay. 
Uh, that said, there are folks at different parts in their career journey that find it quite attractive to come to the state. Uh, it is uh, the chance to be involved in some a host of, of uh, different technologies and different contexts that can help accelerate your career, as well as others who, who have maybe had a long successful career in the private sector and are looking to, to give something back to society. Uh, th those are, that's our pitch, and uh, most of the time we're able to find some really good folks to come, come work with us, uh, but it is certainly a challenge in some of those bleeding edge areas like cloud and security. Senator Fate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions for the Deputy Commissioner? Deputy Commissioner, I have one. Uh, you mentioned at the start of your presentation uh, the creation of Minute and uh, then Representative Downey and Representative Khan hugging on the floor. I remember that. Uh, and uh, just recently, someone was talking with me about Minute and what a strong uh, department it is. Um, and that is you now a decade or more, I suppose, of time. Uh, and I know the current administration, the Wells administration, is talking about uh, some restructuring or creation uh, uh, of new agencies. And I am wondering if you or others in the department would be available for advice for this committee um, as we uh, take up those issues if the administration uh, indeed brings them forward. Uh, Madam Chair, I can confidently say uh, with my commissioner behind me, absolutely. And uh, we've, we've already discussed, started discussions internally because one thing we've learned throughout the pandemic is you better be ahead of the law actually uh, being passed uh, and be ready to deliver at the, the moment uh, that signature gets applied. Uh, even with significant planning time, want to get as ahead of it as we can. Right. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Deputy Acton, um, it shows on this your slide presentation, you resolve 35,000 plus service desk tickets a month with a 4.7 satisfaction rating. Would that apply also to your 160 projects that you mentioned on slide six? Deputy Commissioner. Madam Chair, Senator Anderson, great question. Uh, they are distinct buckets. So the service desk tickets are something along the lines of calling in to say, I've forgotten my password, I need my password reset. I'm having an issue getting a piece of software loaded on my computer or working properly. Microsoft Teams is, is behaving strangely, I, I don't know why. It, it's those type of break fix activities or um, simply a request for something that comes in via a ticket. It's sort of a one and done task. The projects are much more time consuming involving lots of folks uh, who are engaged over a prolonged period of time and, you know, around a discrete focused effort, a project effort. So it, the 4.7 would only apply to the, the ticket based activities, not to the projects. So Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. So Deputy Eichten, what are your um, satisfaction rating on your 160 projects? Deputy Commissioner. Madam Chair, Senator Anderson, I, I would say the equivalent to a, a satisfaction rating, uh, the closest thing to it would be the overall status. So we, we track every month the an enterprise portfolio reporting process, the status of the project based on, on a few different areas, time, schedule, scope, um, and then overall health of the project. And you've got the classic stoplight rating of red, yellow, green, uh, and then risks being tracked against that project and, and mitigating actions being taken to hopefully mitigate those risks. So there is an annual report that we provided the legislature with every active project in state government and its current status, red, yellow, green, uh, that came out in October of last year. And I think that's where you would look for the equivalent to that satisfaction rating, or the closest thing. Madam Chair, Senator Senator Deputy Acton, I don't remember seeing that, but if you can get one yeah. to me, I would love to see that Absolutely. report. Deputy Commissioner, if you'd send that to our office, then we'll make sure all the committee members get it. Absolutely. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, I'd like to invite the commissioner to join us. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner. Um, and for the last of our agenda today, we're going to take up uh, the hopeful confirmation of uh, Commissioner Tomes. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, we have before you uh, the request for this confirmation, uh, your resume. And what we would like is if you could talk to us a little bit about you, um, where you've been, 
what you hope to accomplish uh, before we take up the question for confirmation. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Murphy, uh, Vice Chair Mitchell, and committee members. For the record, my name is Tarek Tomes, and I was appointed by Governor Waltz to serve as the Commissioner of the Department of Information Technology Services, or MINUT, and Chief Information Officer for the State of Minnesota. First, I'd like to say what an incredible honor it is to be appointed by Governor Waltz. Over the past four years, I've been proud to work alongside so many talented individuals at Minute and across government to deliver on our vision, creating an innovative digital government that works for everyone. I've been fortunate to spend over 30 years in the technology career, in my technology career, often working with global Fortune 100 organizations. The work that we have done together at Minute over the past four years has truly been transformational. We have partnered together to, relent to relentlessly advocate for the ways that technology can improve outcomes for our stakeholders and ultimately for the people of Minnesota. I've been fortunate to lead teams and work with people that not only lean into large-scale interagency efforts, but who use those opportunities to truly transform the expectations for technology and state government. When I stepped into this role in April of 2019, the biggest question we had to answer was how would we help fix MINLARS? We partnered with the legislature, the Blue Ribbon Council on Information Technology, DPS, and stakeholders to overhaul the driver and vehicle system going live with MinDrive in November of 2020, one year. I'm happy to report that in the following year, MinDrive processed 8.2 million application applications and is now an incredible example of how we should create IT systems that meet the needs focusing on self-service, user adoption, collaboration, and innovation. When you think about all that technology has done over the past four years for state government, it is truly incredible. Since mid-2019, we have delivered over 460 projects to do everything from keeping our bridges safe by inspecting them with virtual reality and drones to enabling driver's tests and license renewals to be completed online and at home. The COVID-19 pandemic response also drove rapid adoption of digital services, like the over 1 million Minnesotans who in 2020 received over $9.1 billion in unemployment insurance system payments. By enabling people to connect digitally with government, we helped improve outcomes when they needed it the most. In 2022, Minnesota was recognized with an A grade for the use of technology to improve service delivery for the first time in Minnesota's history, one of only six states to receive the highest, state, highest grade in the country. We have consistently delivered on our promise to provide secure, reliable technology solutions to improve the lives of all Minnesotans. Last year, state technology enabled 1.2 million Minnesotans who worked on the front lines of COVID-19 to receive bonus pay, distributed over $18.5 million to veterans and their families eligible for a service bonus, and extended the availability of free or reduced price school meals to over 50,000 students. To accomplish this work, we put the people of Minnesota and their needs first, embedding human-centered design and moving forward the government that Minnesotans deserve. Every time that our customers and users, clients and partners interact with us, they should feel their time, energy and needs are valued. I will continue to ask, how might we meet Minnesotans where they are at? In the pursuit of this answer, we will not just modernize technology, but also the way that IT and agencies work together to improve outcomes for Minnesotans. We have not been doing this work alone. Over the past four years, we have had incredible opportunities to collaborate across state government, local governments, and the private sector with Minnesota's Technology Advisory Council and the newly formed Cybersecurity Task Force that is building a whole of state approach and cybersecurity plan to protect the information of Minnesotans and visitors and keep critical systems running. I am humbled by the breadth of work I've been fortunate to participate in and champion for the future. We will continue to expand our partnerships, promote data-driven decisions, and deliver people-centered government services that return time, agility, and ease of use to the people of Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Tomes. 
I think before we could ever consider confirmation, we must get Commissioner Tomes some assistance to update his resume. It still it would be the first commissioner who states that he's still employed with the city of St. Paul. So we'd love to get you some help there, Commissioner. Uh, but, uh, Thank you, Senator Curran. We appreciate the, the, you know, we've had a great work in relationship. We've done a lot of really good things, and, and we will continue to make sure that that happens. And, and I think on the memoirs piece of it, right, we went through that. Um, we will continue to make sure we provide education or structural changes so your job gets easier. Because um, I don't believe we have a technology problem. We have a business knowledge resource issue. And, and we can find great unity in building on that. And we, and we will continue to do that. Um, but on, on the men drives, too, and I think the, the only piece you left out was um, we found a great private company with tremendous experience and knowledge, which allowed us to move forward as, we, as I think it is a great model for most things we do. Um, they bring expertise that we don't have, and, and we'd love to continue to see that um, that model of outsourcing, you know, 80% or whatever that is. And so we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Senator Cran. Other questions or comments? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Tomes, Commissioner Tomes, <clears throat> how does, uh, now that we're under Min Drive uh, versus Min Lars, um, I remember Senator um, Scotty Newman just is beside himself when he came to Minlars. So give us an update of what the comparison is. How, how do you see the, the pluses uh, on the Min Drive versus the Minlars? Commissioner. Chair Murphy, Senator Anderson, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, just as it relates uh, to the resume, uh, maybe for the record, uh, that was actually quite intentional. I wanted to make sure that uh, everyone knew that I was not looking for a new job, so I don't have an updated resume, um, <laughs> as I am uh, incredibly uh, <laughs> looking forward to delivering on what's next. Uh, the, the question, I think, is an excellent one. You know, I think uh, probably core to that is, is we joined a... Uh, a, a vendor solution that has continual investment and innovation because they have a relatively large market share across the country. And so no longer are we creating a custom developed uh, application that may not have funding and resources for innovation, let alone funding for just the maintenance and uptake. We join into a vendor marketplace solution that continually evolves and changes, and we get to learn from what other states are doing, whether it's digital driver's licenses or the way that uh, tabs are renewed. We have a vendor that is continually evolving and changing their product, and we get the benefit from that. We get to add those enhancements to the state of Minnesota and, and uh, benefit from that uh, innovation. And so just to, to sum it up, I think in instances, as uh, Senator Coran pointed out, and certainly the work for the Blue Ribbon Council and the Technology Advisory Advisory Committee, when we can, we want to rent a solution. If we can't rent a solution, we want to buy a solution. And only when those two don't exist in the marketplace do we want to build something from scratch. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam <clears throat> Chair. Um, well, I know back in, in my county, uh, going to cities and going to county uh, boards and, and uh, that... Um, I don't know if they've gotten rid of the word Minlars yet, because it's a swear word. And uh, so I'm hoping that minute uh, will continue. Because, but I just heard this at a quarterly township business meeting that when I was talking about minute, and they go, "Quit swearing." Um, I thought what, and I thought we had changed the the, the dynamic, but I guess it's it's going to be a growing and a hopefully a, a proving of the pudding to those uh, outfits in my area, the counties, the townships, the cities, so forth and so on, to get to the point to say, yeah, I like Minute and I like where it's going. Commissioner. Uh, uh, Chair Murphy and Senator Anderson, I, I think uh, for us, one of the things that's really important is, is that we get out and about. Uh, certainly early on in my tenure, I uh, visited a driver and vehicle uh, renewal station in Ely, Minnesota. Uh, I've been to uh, St. Cloud to see how human services are delivered at a county level. We meet on a monthly basis with our county partners and those connections that we have with our tribal nations, cities, counties, educational opportunities, that broader universe, uh, the, the cyber commission on on uh, uh, that task force that is geared towards creating that whole of state of plan. It's really important 
that we continue to connect with the stakeholders that use technology services and that we really you know, broadly embrace the, the thoughts and input and feedback that they have. Senator Anderson, uh, I just you know, learned the hard way that swearing is against the rules in the Senate, so <laughs> gotta go easy. Could you repeat that? <laughs> Thank you. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Tomes. Um, over the last six or eight years, uh, we've had just way too many examples of fraud in state government. Uh, whether you're looking at Medicaid fraud, uh, the, the expected or anticipated billion dollars or more per biennium there at one point that was extrapolated from the legislative auditor's report, uh, or the $100 million in the, um, the uh, child care welfare fraud. Uh, now more recently, we've got 250 or $500 million of fraud in the Feeding Our Future scandal. Commissioner, what types of efforts? I see 160 projects completed. I'm trying to remember, was it 300 and something that that universe was from or something uh, that uh, Deputy Commissioner Eichen talked about? Um, and I see enumerated here in the presentation that, that the Deputy Commissioner did um, some of those projects, which are to have government deploy resources and put energy into sending the, the people's money out to people. What types of projects uh, of, of these 300 or 160 do we have in minute to, uh, to capture fraud, to, to find people committing fraud and prevent future fraud? Commissioner. Chair Murphy, uh, Senator Draskowski, uh, the ability or the, the need to use technology in addition to other means and mechanisms to help both detect and prevent fraud is, is really important. Uh, during a, a recent initiative, the Frontline Worker Pay Initiative, we really leveraged heavily the fraud detection uh, mechanisms and capabilities that exist in our unemployment insurance system and in our taxation systems and brought that as an interagency effort to our frontline worker pay. And so our ability and, and need to continue to look at the portfolio of initiatives that we have as a whole and bring those best of government efforts that we have in existing places so that not every agency is starting from scratch as it relates to fraud uh, prevention and detection is really important. Certainly the technology that exists in those spaces and the ability to connect to other systems is growing and, and certainly improving and we look to implement and leverage as much of that as possible but an intentional approach to fraud protection and prevention certainly was a huge part of the frontline worker pay initiative and will continue to be a, a, a really big part of initiatives that we participate in. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for that. As a matter of fact, I did poke around a little bit with that frontline worker pay, and I was heartened to hear that uh, there was some effort. As a matter of fact, I can't remember the numbers, but an unbelievable number of people applied multiple times for the front worker pay fraud. Uh, the fraud. There's so much fraud, that's all I can think about. Um, <sighs> uh, but for the front, front work, frontline worker pay program, um, and uh, when, I, when I started to ask questions, of course, um, the, the government's reaction was that they didn't have a lot of specifics to share with me about that, and that, I found that frustrating, and it probably requires some more pursuit. Um, but, Commissioner, can you tell us, has the governor or the Department of Education or others asked for your help um, in tracking down, uh, we're, we're learning, of course, that there's some of the same actors in fraud across programs, whether you're talking, they were looking at the Feeding Our Future fraud uh, recipients that were defrauding us of a half a billion dollars potentially, and finding some of them were also defrauding us uh, in the daycare welfare area. Um, has the governor or the commissioner of education or have others asked for your help in designing a system in, in identifying those people uh, and also preventing it in the future. Commissioner, this is an important topic, of course, and we're nearing the end of our hour, and we do want to complete the business of the work, so I don't want to shortchange your answer. I do want to say that this is probably a topic we'll come back to. 
Chair Murphy, uh, Senator Graskowski, uh, certainly wherever technology is involved, and in, in, in that is you know, really in all spaces uh, related to the way government delivers services, uh, we participate in both trying to uh, detect and track down uh, the digital footprints that someone leaves behind it, and certainly would love to follow back up with the committee. Thank you, well, Madam Chair, if I, if I Senator could. Senator Thank you. So, so Commissioner, really I, I want to know, has the governor or the Department of Education asked for your help in fraud in this area that I talked about, feeding our future? Commissioner. Senator Murphy, uh, uh, uh -huh. Senator Draskowski, yes, we're, we're involved in uh, looking at the data and, and the uh, digital transactions and footprints that were uh, involved in that uh, particular service area. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Draskowski. Are there further questions before we take up action on this uh, confirmation? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Tomes, uh, could you give us kind of a, a, a draft report on those um, working relationships with the, as Senator Draskowski just said, Department of Education and the governor, and what has transpired so we as legislators can get an idea of what, what's going on between the, the, the agencies and the department from your vantage point. I'd appreciate it. Commissioner, and when you um, are ready, please share that with our office and we'll make sure and get it to the committee members. We'll do that, Chair Murphy. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions? Is there a motion before the committee? Senator Fate. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I move to recommend the confirmation of the appointment of Mr. Tomes to be the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of IT Services. Thank you. That uh, motion before us, properly before us. Are there any questions to the motion? Senator Fate has moved uh, to re recommend the confirmation of the appointment of Commissioner Tarek Tomes to be the Commissioner of the Department of IT Services. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion is adopted. We will send this forward. Congratulations. Thank you, committee members. Thank you. And with that, members, meeting is adjourned.